les workshops 1 et 4 vont se dérouler dans cette salle, c'est le salon Brasilia. Euh, les salons Panama et Amazon pour les autres workshops se font de l'autre côté du bâtiment. Donc il faut descendre cet escalier et poursuivre. Tout sera fléché, donc vous ne devriez pas vous perdre. En cas de besoin, n'hésitez pas à, à prendre euh, tâche auprès de l'un des bénévoles qui, euh, qui, est présent, euh, qui sont présents euh, pour vous guider. J'aimerais maintenant euh, accueillir euh, à la tribune euh, Alexander Aleinikov, qui est au commissaire adjoint des Nations Unies pour les réfugiés. Euh, avant d'être nommé au commissaire adjoint des Nations Unies pour les réfugiés en février 2010, euh, Alexander Aleinikov a occupé les fonctions de doyen de la faculté de droit et de vice-président exécutif de l'université de Georgetown de janvier euh, de, de 2004 à 2010. Il est également membre de la faculté de droit de l'université de Georgetown depuis 1997. Sous l'administration Clinton, Alexander Lenikov a servi en tant que conseiller général et commissaire exécutif associé au service d'immigration et de naturalisation des états unis où il a supervisé le développement de programmes. Et de 1995 à 1997, il fut associé, associé senior à l'Institut des politiques migratoires et membre de son conseil d'administration de 2004 à 2010. Il a notamment euh, coprésidé le groupe de travail chargé de l'examen de la politique d'immigration au sein de l'équipe du président Barack Obama, et a travaillé en tant que consultant au commissariat des Nations Unies pour les réfugiés dans le cadre des consultations mondiales sur la protection euh, des réfugiés. Aujourd'hui, Alexander Alenikov nous fait l'immense honneur d'être présent euh, pour nous parler de sa vision de l'accès à l'information et la culture dans les situations d'urgence humanitaire. Merci de l'accueillir. Merci, Jeremy, and excuse me for speaking in English. Uh, I must say, though, your introduction of me sounds much better in French. <laughs> it's my pleasure to be here at this conference, and it's a pleasure for UNHCR to be partnering uh, with Libraries Without Borders. There are five million children of school age who are refugees, five million. And if you could put them in school buses, and each school bus held 60 children, and you put the school buses one in front of the other, the school buses would reach from Paris to Prague. This is a huge burden on the world uh, to deal with this, uh, the, this issue and for us to take note of. The problem for refugee children is that far too few of them attend school. About one third of uh, six to 13 year olds are not in school. Two thirds of children aged 14 to 17 are not in school. And the opportunities for adult education and vocational training for lifetime learning are extremely limited. About half of the world's refugees live in camps. Uh, and where there are schools, frequently the student-faculty ratio is greater than 40 to 1. And many of the teachers have had no formal training or qualification. For refugees outside of camps, many are not permitted to enter local public schools or they're charged fees that put education beyond their reach. Now, it's not surprising that these problems are particularly acute in emergency situations, as has been noted this morning, where the usual concern is providing clothing and food and emergency shelter. Uh, issues of education uh, sometimes lag. And over the past several years, UNHCR has faced more concurrent emergencies than any time in our 60-year existence starting a few years ago in Cote d'Ivoire, and now Mali, and Sudan and South Sudan, uh, in Somalia, uh, where hundreds of thousands of people fled in 20 to, uh, 2011 to Kenya, Ethiopia, Djibouti, and Yemen, the Democratic Republic of Congo in recent months, the Central African Republic, all of these countries have sent hundreds of thousands of people over borders, and of course now the Syria crisis. There are now more than two million Syrians across borders. The film we saw earlier said 1.6, that was July. Now it's 2.1 million. They've fled to Lebanon, to Jordan, to Turkey, 
to Iraq, to Egypt, and elsewhere. And there are perhaps four million internally displaced Syrians. This may mean that one out of every three Syrian families has faced displacement in recent years. UNHCR and UNICEF recently announced a tragic figure when we passed the one million mark of refugee children. The world is now beginning to speak of a lost generation of Syrian children, those who have witnessed the horrors and privations of the war that will affect them the rest of their lives. Educational opportunity is one of the costs of the crisis. It has been disrupted, we estimate, for 2.5 million children. And for example, in Lebanon, where there are 200,000 school-aged Syrian refugee children, only about 60,000 of them are currently in school. Now, as dramatic and disturbing as these numbers are for these emergency situations, they represent, in fact, only a small portion of out-of-school refugee <coughs> children. It's these emergencies that claim the headlines and much of the international attention and financial support. But there are millions of other refugees and refugee children who are in long-standing refugee situations. We call them protracted refugee situations at UNHCR. There are several million Afghan refugees still in Pakistan and Iran, nearly a million Somalis in countries neighboring Somalia, uh, three million internally displaced people inside Colombia, and in East Sudan, where there are Eritrean refugees, some have been there for 40 years. Now, I don't need to explain to this audience the benefits of education, of literacy, and of literature. But for refugee children, the benefits are surely magnified. And here, if I can comment on the last panel's discussion of good books and bad books, and we probably all have our lists of good books and bad books, even the bad books can be useful uh, in emergency situations and in protracted situations because they help people learn language and gain literacy, no matter the quality, ultimately, of the literature they're reading. But schools provide more than literacy. They can play a very important role in working towards gender equality. Let me say why. First of all, they often provide access to school for girls where they would be denied access uh, in their home countries. Secondly, they provide protection. They provide safe spaces for girls who may be victims of uh, abuse uh, in other parts of the camp or in their homes. And they can provide counseling for victims of abuse. They provide skills that can support independence and move beyond a culture of dependency in the camps to one of, uh, of self-reliance and skills that can be learned uh, and used upon return. And they also provide a civics lesson to both boys and girls in the schools about notions uh, of gender equality, norms that we hope will imbue uh, the camp but also upon return uh, to their home uh, countries. And camps also provide a diversion. You saw in the Oxfam film, the refugee who said, we, what we eat, uh, we drink, and we sleep. We eat, we drink, we sleep. Schools obviously provide something for children to do, a place to be uh, in association with other kids and to be learning. These are fairly, I think, straightforward and obvious benefits of education. But there's something else, something else beyond these values of education, and it, it gets at the core of the status of being a refugee. Now, to some degree, refugees are actually in a favored status. They're among the most fortunate of the world's displaced people. Why? Because they have fled out of, safe, uh, have fled out of danger across borders where they're provided safety and support and assistance by the international community and by the host communities. And, to see this, compare the situation of Syrian refugees who have gotten to a camp in Jordan versus Syrians who are internally displaced or actually unable to leave their homes in Syria but victims of uh, routine uh, bombing, violence, and other forms of disruption. But that being said, being a refugee carries with it a special set of harms, psychological, social, and cultural. Refugees frequently live in a world of isolation. 
cut off from their home communities, unable to establish robust new communities. Another refugee in the Oxfam film said, we have lost our past, we have lost our present, we have lost our future. That's the sense of being picked up from your home, put elsewhere, and separated from all you knew, all that gave you a robust lives. For those who live in camps, the cultural disruption caused by displacement is often dramatically increased. Here is where cultural materials, and particularly literature, can play a vital role. Uh, literature, I would suggest, created the first virtual communities. They connected the imaginations of authors and readers that knew no physical boundaries and existed across space and time long before the internet. And here I'm reminded of, of Proust's description of reading in A la Recherche du Temps Perdu, where the narrator recalls how literature could make the world conjured by the author seem more real than the garden in which he sat at in, in Cambrai, and how despite the fact that he knew he was reading fiction, he nevertheless felt as though he was getting closer to the truth. Now, this is gonna be a difficult task for the interpreters because I'm gonna quote a paragraph of Proust in English, which then has to be translated into Proustian French, so, so good luck. <laughs> okay, but here's what Proust writes. It matters not that the actions, the feelings of this new order of creatures appear to us in the guise of truth, since we have made them our own, since it is in ourselves that they are happening, that they are holding in thrall, while we turn over feverishly the pages of the book, our quickening breath and staring eyes. And once the novelist has brought us to that state, why then for the space of an hour, he sets free within us all the joys and sorrows in the world, a few of which only we should would have to spend years of actual life in getting to know. And I think this gets also at the point that I, I think what Patrick was making that Reading is not a, just a passive act. It actually can be quite active. It can give people a sense of action as they sit with a book by, by sparking imagination and sparking creative activity uh, afterwards. That there was a fascinating study that was just published in a very distinguished scientific journal called, appropriately, Science. It came out this week. And it dem this is true, this is true. It demonstrates scientifically what readers of literature have always known within their hearts, and that is that after reading literary fiction, the scientists found, people perform better on, texts, on tests measuring empathy, social perception, and emotional intelligence. The results for literary fiction were significantly greater than for popular fiction or serious nonfiction. And the researchers suggested that the reason might be, quote, literary fiction often leaves more to the imagination, encouraging readers to make inferences about characters and be sensitive to emotional nuance and complexity. And one of the scientists who conducted the study was quoted in the newspaper saying, in liter literary fiction, like Dostoevsky, there's no single overarching authorial voice each character presents a different version of reality, and they aren't necessarily reliable. You have to participate as a reader in this dialectic, which is really something you have to do in real life. Now, in Proust's day, obviously, the connections of author to text to reading to reader were made through the written word. But today, we have a whole new world of connection open to us through technology. And maybe you'll be surprised to learn that our refugee classrooms, like classrooms everywhere, are being transformed by technology. Now this is at a much slower rate than most other classrooms, but technology is present in many of our classrooms. UNHCR's Community Technology Access Program trains students for computer literacy in now 56 sites in 25 countries. So for example, I was in Nepal uh, about a year ago at our refugee camps there that have been open for many years for Bhutanese refugees uh, in Nepal. And I was taken to one of these uh, community technology access uh, sites and s walked among uh, the young people who were learning computer literacy. 
And I think instead of paying attention to the teacher, I noticed that almost all of them were on their Facebook pages. And, but this is the way they reach out to the world now and make connections. Through, techno through, through technology, we can offer tremendous opportunities for refugees, online classes from around the world. So in three camps, we're working with the Jesuit Commons project called Higher Education at the Margins to provide distance learning college level courses that can lead to a liberal studies diploma at the end of the course. And we're hoping to multiply these efforts at lifetime learning. Technology has other possible vital payoffs. It offers real potential in opening up refugee camps, bringing the world to refugee camps, and connecting with diaspora communities. This is particularly important in the protracted situations uh, I described, which can create years of sense of isolation. Technology can also bring refugee camps to the world, and it can give refugees a voice and amplify that voice. So in our camp, uh, the largest refugee camp in the world is in uh, northeast Kenya. It's called the Dadaab Camp. It's got probably about 400, more than 400,000 refugees. It's the third largest city in Kenya. There is now a website, dadaabcamps.com, and the home page of this website, which is run by refugees, let me just read you a bit of this home page, which uh, uh, welcomes the, uh, the visitor. The website is, quote, aimed at showing current events at the Dab refugee camps. The web also educates the community on issues affecting their daily lives, like risks of female genital mutilation and the consequences of gender-based violence. The security of the camps are also addressed in the web. The web also serves as a tool of campaign as it addresses emergencies. Uh, every refugee has the right to take part and contribute. We give a chance to job seekers to know if there are any vacancies available in NGOs in the camps. Donors and well-wishers are welcome to support the progress of the web, et cetera, and it ends by saying, spend a week with us and we think you will not find a better source of news from inside the refugee camps. Remarkable, isn't it? It's just remarkable. So these two ideas I've been discussing, one, the role of literature in opening up the mind, and two, the role of technology in opening up refugee camps, I think come together in the idea of Libraries Without Borders Ideas Box. We are delighted to be partnering with Libraries Without Borders on the Ideas Box, and I think there will be a demonstration later in the program about what the box will include, which is a satellite internet connection and some touchscreen tablets and books in electronic and paper form and other cultural activities and, and a mobile uh, screen, I guess screen for a mobile um, cinema. What's new about the ideas box from our perspective is that the, that the content is loaded before the technology arrives and specifically attuned to the refugee crisis uh, that the boxes are delivered. UNHCR has frequently had donations of computer technology where people just simply send us computers, empty computers, and we can teach computer literacy with it, but we don't have a way of plugging into the cultural and educational lives of the refugees. Or we get donations of big boxes of books, as said, people discarding the books they didn't care about and they're randomly uh, selected and given to refugees to read. What the Ideas Box does, as I understand the, the concept, is actually front load or preload the computers with appropriate cultural material. And I think the real challenge for the project will be a very careful analysis of what is appropriate to put on those computers. Um, as our uh, Afghan colleague raised earlier in the conference, uh, talk to the refugees about what they want to, to have on there. And by the way, that's not gonna be an easy task because what language will you teach in? What ma including materials on culture we think is sort of you know life of the mind and high culture, but it will inevitably be a political choice about what is included. What will that mean for the messages being sent to the, to, re to the recipients? What will they ask for? What difficulty will that place the people in who, who actually handle the ideas boxes? All this has to be very carefully worked out, it seems to me, uh, for the project to be a success. But we are delighted that the plan is for the first five boxes now to be delivered uh, to our camps in Burundi, um, we hope by January 2014, 
for a, a one-year pilot. What we, see, what we see is that the ideas box has the promise of ameliorating the debilitating isolation of refugee camps, both in connecting refugees with the world and the world connecting with refugees, both the real world and the world of thought and creativity. So let me go back to the buses. Imagine this string of buses from Prague to Paris to Prague. And if in each bus there were an ideas box, I don't think we'd be speaking of a lost generation of Syrian children. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does it work? Thank you uh, very much, uh, Alex, for a very th thoughtful and inspiring speech. Uh, 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 in the name of Laberus Albert, I would like to thank you and all your team and Jacqueline Strecker and Philippe Leclerc for working with you. Would be, we are very proud of it. We, it's a big challenge. You just mentioned all the tasks, all the hurdles we can go through. Finding the best product, the best book, we'll do it with you and we are very happy to work in the next months, in the more coming months, on deploying the boxes in Burundi with you in your camps. Uh, Alex has accepted to take some questions, uh, so because we are on a tight schedule, I will ask all the people who have any question to uh, 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 ask them all together or one after one, but we will take all the questions now. Do you have any question for Alex Alenikov? No question? Okay, so I, I just uh, say again, uh, thank you, Alex. In fact, it was introduced by Jeremy, but so Jeremy could say, but what, what I would add now, that I've been a friend and a colleague of Alex in the earlier life too. <laughs> We even wrote an article together uh, uh, on the issue, but uh, so it's a special uh, pleasure uh, and a special move to reconnect uh, in, a new in this new life we have together. Uh, he himself, uh, number two of the UNHCR, myself, uh, uh, president uh, of uh, Labour Without Border. I never thought it would be to happen that way, but, I'm, but, but I am very happy that uh, in, uh, we are going to work together on this uh, very important project uh, to deliver uh, to the refugee camps to this uh, to the beginning of this million to a, a small portion I would say of this million of refugees waiting for more action in, uh, in culture to start with you doing it and hopefully it will uh, develop and it will and you will be able to mobilize other NGOs and the UN so that at every level of, uh, uh, at in every part of the world and at, at every level of any NGO, this dimension will be taken into account better than it is now. Thank you very much. So, don't, the, the, the session continue and now Jeremy will introduce it. J'invite euh, maintenant à me, à me rejoindre euh, pour cette euh, session sur l'état des lieux euh, de l'accès à l'information et à la culture dans les situations d'urgence humanitaire. Maria Garrido, Crystal Bott, Lucie Morillon, Patricia Aldana et Jacqueline Strecker. Merci. Merci, euh, merci beaucoup de me, me rejoindre pour cette euh, dernière session de la matinée qui doit, euh, je crois, poser un petit peu les bases euh, un petit peu théoriques, je dirais, de, des workshops de cet après-midi qui auront euh, plus une approche pratique sur, euh, sur les différents euh, 
métiers, les différents engagements de chacun dans ces, dans ces domaines de l'accès à l'information et à la culture. Alors, euh, je crois que Alexander Alenikov l'a très bien dit, aujourd'hui, euh, le monde compte plus de 43 millions de personnes réfugiées. Et finalement, au-delà de ces besoins vitaux sur lesquels l'aide humanitaire apporte déjà énormément, euh, très vite, d'autres privations se manifestent. Et en, en réalité, quand nous avons lancé l'urgence de lire euh, la campagne l'année dernière, nous avons euh, ciblé trois ruptures qui nous intéressaient. D'abord, une rupture socio-culturelle qui est induite par euh, la perte des repères géographiques et symboliques, le traumatisme, le deuil. Et les populations réfugiées sont souvent dans l'incapacité de se, se projeter, de se reconstruire. Et elles font également face à, à l'ennui et à l'inactivité, on y reviendra. Une rupture informationnelle, ensuite, euh, avec la destruction des canaux traditionnels de l'accès à l'information, qui engendre des risques de rumeurs, de propagande, de désinformation. Et une rupture éducative, je crois que euh, Alexander Lenikov l'a bien montré, euh, avec l'interruption de la scolarité des enfants, des étudiants, le manque d'outils pédagogiques et l'absence, finalement, de ces espaces de normalité, ces espaces sécurité où les enfants peuvent prendre le temps de s'épanouir. Euh, alors, on reviendra sur des exemples du Chili, d'Haïti, du Japon... Euh, plus récemment de la Syrie, des printemps arabes, dans lesquels, euh, finalement, ces lieux, ces espaces, que sont les bibliothèques, ont pu jouer un rôle fondamental. Alors, ce n'est pas quelque chose qui est nouveau, en fait. Hein. À l'issue de la Première Guerre mondiale, le comité américain euh, d'aide aux régions dévastées, le, le CARD, est intervenu en France afin de créer des bibliothèques destinées aux enfants pour les aider à dépasser leur traumatisme. Et de telles initiatives se retrouvent tout le, dans tout le XXe siècle, après la Seconde Guerre mondiale, ou lors du conflit euh, euh, en Yougoslavie, par exemple. Mais ces dernières années, je crois qu'il y a eu quelque chose de... une rupture profonde qui s'est euh, manifestée avec l'apparition des nouvelles technologies qui ont profondément changé la donne et les moyens, comme les besoins, finalement, de s'informer, de communiquer, de lire, d'écrire. Alors, il nous a semblé essentiel aujourd'hui, avant de démarrer les ateliers pratiques, je dirais, de revenir sur ces trois ruptures, et enfin, d'en faire un, un état des lieux. Où en est-on aujourd'hui où va-t-on J'ai le plaisir aujourd'hui d'avoir avec moi Patricia Aldana. Patricia Aldana a grandi au Guatemala et s'est installée au Canada en 1971, si mes notes sont exactes. Euh, alors elle a longtemps travaillé dans l'édition jeunesse avec l'ambition de rechercher des auteurs représentant tous les peuples canadiens, les aborigènes, aux derniers arrivés et d'appuyer leur développement. Et elle a été surtout, et c'est pour cette raison qu'elle que, que nous fait le, le, le plaisir et l'honneur d'être ici, elle a été présidente de 2006 à 2010 de l'IBI, la Commission internationale pour les livres de la jeunesse, une ONG qui est composée en fait de multiples organismes de promotion de la lecture dans 73 pays. Et elle nous parlera de son travail auprès des enfants et de ses livres qui soignent. Maria Garrido, Maria est professeure à la faculté, je, je vais vous montrer parce que je ne crois pas que... On vous est encore euh, tout à fait identifié. La faculté de l'information de l'université de Washington, euh, ses recherches explorent la façon dont les individus, au sein des communautés qui font face à des défis économiques et sociaux, exploitent les moyens de communication pour promouvoir le changement social. L'essentiel de son travail se concentre sur l'appropriation des technologies dans des contextes de mouvements sociaux ou de migration internationale. Et elle a récemment conduit une étude sur les bibliothèques chiliennes après le séisme de 2010, dont elle nous parlera tout à l'heure. Lucie Morillon, de l'autre côté de, de l'estrade, qui est directrice de la recherche à Reporters sans frontières. Elle supervise et coordonne le, développement, le département de la recherche et le pôle assistance de l'organisation, également responsable du bureau Internet et Nouveaux Médias. Elle reviendra plus particulièrement sur cette rupture informationnelle dont, dont je viens de parler. Crystal Bott, euh, spécialiste de l'éducation en situation d'urgence, euh, qui travaille auprès d'agences telles que l'UNICEF, le HCR, euh, le NORAG et le réseau Open Society Foundations. Il est cofondateur et dirigeant actif du réseau Interagence pour l'éducation en situation d'urgence, AINI, et le Global Coalition to Protect Education from Attack. Jacqueline Strecker, enfin, spécialiste innovation et éducation au Commissariat des Nations Unies pour les Réfugiés. Euh, depuis 2012, elle est en charge de la coordination de l'Innovation Learn Lab, laboratoire d'apprentissage de l'innovation. Le Learn Lab est un espace dédié à l'échange de bonnes pratiques en matière d'innovation dans l'éducation qui vise à créer un environnement propice au développement de nouvelles idées, notamment grâce à un incubateur de projets. Alors Jacqueline, justement, c'est justement euh, vers vous que j'aimerais euh, me tourner pour lancer cette discussion. Vous avez travaillé sur nombreux terrains humanitaires ces dernières années et avez rejoint le siège du HCR assez récemment. Quel bilan Tirez-vous de votre expérience sur, sur ces questions-là d'accès à l'information, à la culture, dans les nombreux terrains, les nombreux euh, lieux que vous avez pu euh, euh, voir, explorer, où vous avez pu travailler des, des évolutions sont-elles à l'œuvre au sein des organisations internationales, et même des ONG, et même, je dirais, des, 
des communautés locales. Merci. And I'd like to thank Jeremy and also Libraries Without Borders for this uh, great opportunity to learn and share. Um, and I'd like to take a moment to sort of reflect on not only the trends, but also the changes within the humanitarian sector. We've seen great evolution within the humanitarian field within the last couple of years. And one of the biggest changes has been the onset of new actors, which we can clearly see today. So originally, when we looked at uh, years ago, the humanitarian assistance was dominated by a select group of international players who were often funded and located in high-income countries. But what we're seeing today is the fact that you've got a whole surge of new actors, which include diaspora populations, the private sector, writers, non-governmental organizations, both locally, regionally, and internationally. And these actors are playing a new and important role in how emergencies are being cared for. We're also seeing an increase in the role and activities of aid recipient governments who are flexing their capacities to also respond to these emergencies. And the onset of these new players is a hallmark of the evolutions within the humanitarian sector as it adapts and accommodates the new humanitarian and global information society. As was noted earlier today, the world is increasingly informed, connected, and self-reliant. Together with the rapid growth of technologies and global interconnectivity, we're seeing distinct changes in how aid is being delivered and also how people and organizations are acting in emergencies. There's also a lot of agency happening within the communities on the ground. One of the most predominant changes is the increasing demand for access to information, books, and cultural materials. OCHA's recent 2013 report noted that we've entered into a network age of humanitarian assistance. One of the fundamental features of this network age is the desire for communication and to have access to books and cultural materials, as well as technology. Coupled with the recognition that access to information is vital, is the acknowledgement that access requires certain human capacities. Organizations like UNHCR and many of its partners are trying to ensure that these fundamental skills are developed through the provision of quality education, but also lifelong learning programs. And that these are part of our emergency response. As Alex noted, education is vital, not only at the onset of an emergency, but given the contemporary protracted nature of most conflicts, education that refugees receive is not just a stopgap, but actually their main shot at education overall. There is also acknowledgement that education must not be limited to children and to youth, but that there are significant gains, as were discussed this morning, to lifelong learning and reading programs. However, despite these recognitions, Access to education is still significantly limited. And Alex mentioned the statistics, which show the huge gaps in not only education for children, but also lifelong learning programs and access to resources for adults. The good news is, coupled with the onset of new actors, the network age is affording new tools that when used effectively can contribute to increasing information and learning programs, as well as providing new ways of disseminating text. It's important to note, and I think many of the trends that we're seeing now, are the lessons learned from early ICT for D and for education programs that have noted that while technologies hold tremendous potential, they are not the pancrea for holistic solutions. I think all actors recognize that they must be carefully examined and all tools must be properly evaluated. We acknowledge that the adoption of technology is dependent on many different factors and at times they can do more harm than good. But with these cautions acknowledged, UNHCR and many of the other actors that are present here have found innovative approaches uh, for embracing the network age and being able to use these tools and resources to provide greater access to information, books, and cultural material. Some of the contributions that UNHCR have mentioned 
or sorry, have already mentioned include the use of the community technology access centers, the building and establishment of community libraries, but we're also looking at using more mobile labs so that we can actually bring these resources directly into the schools. There's been dramatic changes in the use of looking at cell phones and how they can be used to disseminate information, whether it be digital text or audio information. Cell phones, even when there's not network available, can also be used via Bluetooth to be able to flip content to one another. And we're seeing great surges of this taking place, not only in the Arab Spring, but also throughout West Africa, where people are sharing music and audio files, as well as text. We're also working with a range of partners to ensure that not only international text, but also localized text are digitized and made available via e-readers and mobile phones. All of these programs are not about the technology, but more about providing access to reading and information and enhancing and extending these learning opportunities for refugees and displaced communities. Overall, UNHCR and the newly formed UNHCR Innovation recognize that the humanitarian field is rapidly changing, and so too must the traditional humanitarian actors. UNHCR is doing this by embracing a three pronged approach by first amplifying innovative practice taking place in the field, connecting like-minded actors both inside and outside of the agency, and exploring knowledge and expertise that can assist in informing the new humanitarian agenda. It's for this reason that UNHCR is delighted to be here today and to learn from the other panelists as well as from all of the participants here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Jackie. Alors, il y a quelque chose de particulièrement intéressant dans ce que vous dites, et je crois que c'est quelque chose qu'on va retrouver par, dans, 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 dans les deux jours hein, de ces discussions, c'est que finalement, ce n'est pas la technologie qui fait la différence, c'est euh, ce qu'on met dedans et comment on l'adopte, comment on se l'approprie. Et, et je crois que cette, euh, cette dimension-là est, 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 est au cœur du sujet. Alors, vous avez beaucoup parlé des, des, des enfants aussi, de l'éducation, et évidemment, les, les enfants sont toujours les premières victimes des, des crises, euh, des crises humanitaires. Alors, je me, tourne, je, me, je me tourne vers vous, Patricia, parce que je sais à quel point ce sujet vous tient particulièrement à cœur et à quel point vous avez dédié en fait votre, votre vie quasiment à, à cette idée-là que les livres peuvent soigner, que les livres peuvent apporter du réconfort, mais aussi euh, peuvent donner aux enfants la possibilité de raconter, de se raconter, de dire leurs peurs, leurs angoisses, leurs traumatismes, mais aussi leurs espoirs. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous parler un petit peu de cette aventure au sein, au sein d'Ibi Alors, je crois que vous avez un, un PowerPoint, je vais le lancer, je, je le lance tout de suite Bonjour, euh, merci. Euh, C'est un honneur d'être ici avec vous, mais je vais parler en anglais parce que sinon je vais dépasser mon temps certainement. Et Ibi, uh, I am the former president of Ibi and currently the president of the Ibi Foundation, um, is the international board on books for young people. And it was founded 60 years ago by Yella Lepman a German Jew who had uh, fled to London at the start of the war and returned after the war with the American army and found German children in a state of total isolation and ignorance and um, traumatized. Uh, and she began to build um, a collection of international books so that German children could learn about um, what they were seeing. What you're seeing behind us is I'm not going to talk about the specific IBI projects, but you can see the extent of IBI's work in the world. Um, IBI has now 77 national sections. In every country, IBI is its own national section composed of people who live in that country, uh, who work to bring children and books together. And we're also formal, par formal partners with IFLA and the Children's Library and Reading Sections. Um, IBI members in each country could be librarians, teachers, academics, publishers, authors, illustrators, and reading promoters. Um, we do a number of activities on the international level. Uh, most of the IBI's work is national, but uh, one of the programs that's uh, pertinent to this conversation is IBI's program with children in crisis. And you can see it here running behind you, the places where we have conducted um, what really are uh, an intervention of bibliotherapy in post-crisis situations, either civil conflict or, um, or natural disaster. 
And we have learned, uh, really we started doing this in the 90s, um, and I'll talk about that this afternoon, but we have learned a great deal, I think. Uh, we work, we've been working in Gaza, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Aceh province, Venezuela, Haiti, Lebanon, Japan, Colombia, and starting this week, we have a project uh, with Syrian refugees in Lebanon um, for which we're currently raising money. Um, one thing to be said about IBI is it's a very, uh, there are only two people in our na international office, which is based in Basel, and all most of us that work in IBI work as volunteers. So we're quite, um, we're quite a poor organization, but we have a, we're very good at delivering programs quite cheaply. Um, I think the most important message here that I wanted to give, which has been given by everyone that has spoken, is that uh, children who have lost everything um, due to war and disaster, and we haven't said too much about the fact that these children are in deep crisis and shock uh, and trauma. They, of course, they need food, medical sh uh, care and shelter, but they need absolutely, uh, imperatively, I believe, the emotional loving help that is not provided just by books, but by caring, trained adults coming, bringing the books and good books on a regular basis to talk, read, and share, and encourage to express and, um, and discuss feelings. Uh, that is the thing that we haven't said today. To bring books uh, without an adult, without a person, a promoter, uh, the, the person who is giving of themselves to these children and on a regular basis, the books alone or the, the technology alone is simply not going to, to perform the, the therapeutic act that bringing books with a reader can be. The books do need to be carefully selected and IBI does not ever accept donations of books. We buy books in the country where there is a disaster or in the region of the disaster. They're selected by the people in the region, not by, the, not by any central uh, organization. Um, and we do not want to spend money transporting uh, books. We want to acquire locally. We want to support local publishing industries and distribution um, operations, local writing. And of course, it's extremely important that it be culturally pertinent and sensitive and that we have no difficulty with that because we only undertake these projects where we have a national section that is knowledgeable, respected, and, um, and considered to be expert in its own country or in the region. Um, the books need to be diverse. They need to cover all kinds of human experience, uh, tragic, happy, thoughtful, funny. Um, one just tiny example, I was just in Gaza. We have had about an eight year, nine year now, uh, two libraries in Gaza. And in Gaza, they tend to believe that bibliotherapy is always discussing tragedy and what's happened to you, the terrible things that have happened to you. And of course, the children there do need to discuss that. But we asked the children in one of the libraries, what is your favorite book? And it was Cinderella. And even the, uh, I think the people who were working in the library had never asked them that. And it was a, a, and I said, can I see it? And it was a terrible, pirated, really bad uh, version of the Disney Cinderella. It wasn't an Arabic Cinderella or, but that was the book that they all loved the most. And I thought that was so indicative of what, what it is that children uh, are looking for in very difficult situations. Um, these programs need to be rigorous, dependable, and above all, reliable. The readers have to be generous and committed and we have had great luck finding people and training people who are willing to do this on a very uh, regular basis. And uh, the best thing about this is that it works. Uh, we've had decades of experience and the children do benefit enormously. So do their families. Parents of the children in crisis can play an essential ro role in, the, in reading. Uh, often parents take little libraries into their houses and share them with their little neighbors. And it, it really affirms the importance of the family and of the parent in these moments of crisis and helplessness. And there are long-term benefits. Um, it is a reading introduction and for many of these children uh, are barely literate or come from barely literate families. And they, this is one of the places where the joy of reading really is, uh, comes about. And often we've had the experience that institutions, educational institutions and libraries in the areas where the, the crisis has taken place 
learn from us about how to do reading promotion because many systems, as you know, are very traditional and do not know how to do proper reading promotion. IBI is small. Uh, we can only intervene where we are able to do so properly, but we can help others with training and book selection. Um, we believe that these activities should take place in every single uh, humanitarian disaster, that the reading aloud to children in those disasters should become an imperative for every agency working uh, in, in intervening in crisis. Um, it's, uh, as we've heard, the numbers are incredible and children are always the single biggest victims of any war, any natural disaster. They always die way out of proportion to adults. Um, so we ask you urgently to incorporate bibliotherapy into regular practice of frontline agencies. Um, this is what children need. They need these emotional, psychological tools if they're going to help to have a life uh, in the future. I think it's the least we can do. Thank you. Merci, merci beaucoup, euh, merci beaucoup, Patricia. Euh, je, je connais personnellement le travail fantastique qu'a fait la Fondation Ibi à travers, à travers les années. Et en préparant cette, euh, cette, cette table ronde, vous me, vous me disiez au téléphone quelque chose qui résonne beaucoup à Bibliothèque sans frontières, qu'il euh, ne faut pas confondre la, la, la bibliothérapie, la, la lecture pour le loisir avec l'éducation. Euh, on a souvent une approche assez utilitaire de lire pour apprendre euh, euh, le livre, euh, apprendre à lire pour l'école, etc. Et finalement, la lecture pour le loisir, pour le plaisir, pour euh, retrouver l'empathie si, euh, à, travers, à travers les livres, c'est quelque chose qui est essentiel et qu'il ne faut effectivement pas forcément confondre tout à fait avec l'éducation. En tout cas, il faut porter, c'est absolument complémentaire avec euh, les dynamiques éducatives. Mais en même temps, l'éducation, c'est important. Et euh, je pense que Chris euh, va nous en dire quelques mots parce que, euh, parce qu'évidemment, voilà, on, on ne peut pas, on ne peut pas oublier euh, toute cette, euh, toute cette démarche et cette dimension de, euh, de, je dirais, la projection des enfants dans ces situations-là et comment, euh, bah, quand on est enfant, quand on est adolescent dans un camp de réfugiés aujourd'hui, comment on peut se projeter vers l'avenir sans éducation Merci beaucoup. Euh, je vais quand même parler en aussi, euh, pas forcément pour économiser le temps. Ah, Est-ce que ça fonctionne D'accord, merci. Très bien. My theme is education in emergencies. Uh, in 2011, there were 28 and a half million children in conflict-affected countries out of school, children of primary school age. And that, those children constitute half of all of the out-of-school uh, primary school age children in that year. And yet, despite the fact that there are so many children, uh, Alexander Alenikov referred to five million refugee children, of whom about in primary school age, one third are missing out on school, but there are so many more who are not refugees, the internally displaced and those who cannot move, but who are affected by conflict. Despite that huge number, only, uh, I would say that actually the, the, the giving to education, the share of humanitarian funding for education has declined since 2010. It has not increased. In 2011, 2.4% of all humanitarian funding went to education. Last year, 2012, that figure fell to 1.4%. We're actually going backwards in terms of donor commitment to the education of children in conflict and disasters. The uh, humanitarian consolidated appeals processes by which much humanitarian funding is delivered uh, were, were only able to fulfill 26% of the needs identified last year. Already the, num the amount of money requested through those consolidated appeals processes is very small. And donors were only able to stump up one quarter of what was needed. The implication is that three quarters of the needs are going unmet, of the identified needs. Don't talk about the needs were not identified. This is the background to what I'd like to present to you today. 
that in your work in fostering reading, in fostering cultural awareness, and in fostering education in emergency situations, such as uh, Libraries Without Borders <coughs> is engaging in, there needs to be strong and effective evidence-based advocacy with donors so that all our efforts are not just one-off nice projects which have a, a little bit of an impact for a smallish number of people in a certain place. There needs to be a, a ramping up of the commitment by donors, by governments, even by agencies, even UN agencies, to the provision of high quality education to children and young adults in emergencies. And I'd like to outline very quickly seven arguments, seven reasons why that is so important. And you will each, from each of your organizations, I, I think be able to relate, yes, my organization makes a difference in one of these seven areas, perhaps in more than one. The first and I think the most important is the political argument. And this is the one in discussion I've had with sort of senior officials in Ocha and in other places. Communities demand education for their children in emergencies. And when asked to prioritize <coughs> among different services, refugee families and young people and displaced families and young people will very often say that education is more important than even apparently more life-saving services. There's growing evidence coming out of a number of studies, because this is an anecdotal observation by many, many humanitarian workers, that people surprisingly would prioritize education over health services or over shelter. And possibly that's because they feel that they can cope somehow, but they can't teach their own children, at least not officially. They can't educate their own children in a way that results in certification that can make that education useful. So the first argument, education is demanded by the communities, by the parents, and even by the older children. The second is the more abstract argument of human rights. Education is not just a right for those of us who live in safe, calm, stable places. Education is a right for all. The Convention on the Rights of the Child, Article 29. The Convention on the Status of Refugees, Article 22. Uh, the Geneva Conventions. They specify that education must be provided to all in all circumstances and not only in uh, easy times. The third, which has been raised already uh, to a certain extent by, by Alexander and maybe a little bit by Jacqueline as well. Education can be a tool of protection for children and young people in crisis. If during a war or an earthquake or a flood, children and teenagers are not in school, where the hell are they? Well, they may be working, they may be just hanging out, and that exposes them to the risk of recruitment into all kinds of dangerous and sometimes illegal activities, starting with recruitment as child soldiers, moving on to prostitution, drugs, petty crime, all kinds of extremely harmful things. Now, I'm not saying that education is by itself a, a magic pill. Provide school and there'll be no protection problems. That's nonsense. First of all, there are conditions under which education must be provided and safety. If schools are attacked, if schools are actually the subject of armed attack, then it's, they are not protective. And that's the subject of the work of many agencies, including some of those in this room, through the Global Coalition to Protect Education from Attack, uh, a coalition that began in 2010. And a lot more attention is being paid now to the need to strengthen protection of schools from armed attack. But also, internally, schools need to be safe places to learn. If girls or even boys are abused by their teachers, which happens, regrettably, over and over and over again, then schooling is not protective. And that's why international agencies and even national NGOs who are working with ministries of education need to work so hard to ensure that codes of conduct for teachers are respected. Fourth argument, very, very nuanced one, very careful one that needs to be made 
education does help to meet the psychosocial needs of conflict-affected and displaced children or disaster-affected and displaced children. But, again, education is not a magic pill. If you look at the impact of conflict or disaster or displacement upon communities, everybody is affected, but not everybody is traumatised. We have to be careful with the terminology we use. The uh, IASC, International Interagency Standing Committee, guidelines on uh, mental health and psychosocial well-being in emergency situations postulate a, a, a pyramid of impact. Everybody's affected in some way. And as you move up the pyramid, smaller and smaller proportion are more severely affected. And interventions, and I include the kinds of interventions that we're talking about today, um, ideas boxes, EB uh, reading promotion, they need to take into account, you mentioned the term, uh, Patricia, uh, bibliotherapy. We need to be very careful not to medicalize and turn into a clinical problem, treating everybody as though they were the same in a crisis. It's simply not true. What we need to be working towards, and this is where your, the programs we're discussing here today can help Im immensely, is to contribute to community resilience. What will help communities to rebound? And there's strong evidence from, from half a century of psychosocial uh, programming and evaluations that at least 70% of children, with just provision of basic services, including decent education, can uh, rebound from the, the, uh, the suffering that they've gone through. Others need specialised interventions more and more technically refined or, or, or delivered. And a small percentage is estimated by the, uh, the people who developed those guidelines on mental health and psychosocial well-being. Between 3 and 5% are psychotic or extremely neurotic or are suffering terrible uh, uh, symptoms which need a certain type of specialised intervention. We need to be very careful in the programs we deliver that they're targeting the right kinds of needs in the right way. I'll move on. Just three more quick arguments. Education does allow the passage in an efficient way, in an effective way, of life-saving, life skills messages. For example, awareness about landmines, uh, health and hygiene messages, <coughs> HIV AIDS prevention, messages about human rights, about peace and reconciliation. These things can be done more effectively with a large group of children than going house to house with extension workers. It just makes sense. So if we're interested in, in saving lives, education's a good way to do it. Um, Alexander mentioned briefly the, the, the role of education in overcoming gender disparities in, uh, in refugee societies. I've met um, many, many uh, young women. I remember particularly in Pakistan in the refugee camps there from Afghanistan, who had never been to school, and their first experience of school was in a refugee camp. Now, I'm not saying we ought to have wars and disasters so that girls can go to school. That's ridiculous. Of course not. What I'm saying is, somewhere in this tragedy, let's look for the opportunity. If your house burns down, you might find your wedding ring, a lump of gold in the ash, but at least you found it. That's the argument here, that there are opportunities to overcome gender disparities during displacement. Finally, education promotes economic and social reintegration and reconstruction. The average length of time spent by a refugee in Africa over the last generation has been 17 years. The average time spent in a refugee camp, not necessarily an urban setting. Now, that's a tremendous long time. Imagine if there's no education provided. Of course, UNHR and its partners are working uh, to overcome those needs. But if there's going to be any meaningful contribution by people affected by conflict to the rebuilding of their societies, then surely uh, education must play a role. In summary, against see, if you go back to the logic of let's only give 26% of the needs for education in emergency appeals, because after all, education is a luxury. This is, this is the thinking that goes on in the minds of some very senior officials in donor ministries, politicians. Education is a development activity. It's not a humanitarian activity. Nonsense. 
Education saves lives and education sustains life. Merci, merci beaucoup. I gotta stop. Je suis désolé euh, de, de vous couper. Ce que vous dites est absolument passionnant. Je crois même que les, 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 les chiffres que vous avez annoncés en, en, en démarrage de votre, de votre présentation est, sont absolument terrifiants. Je, 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 je n'avais pas connaissance et ce, ce recul dans l'aide humanitaire en, en, en matière d'éducation est effectivement euh, surprenant. Et, euh, et je crois que les arguments que vous avancez sont tout à fait intéressants pour, pour contrer ce recul. Euh, alors, on reviendra tout à l'heure euh, sur... Euh, C'est pour ça que je me permets de vous couper, parce que je pense qu'on reviendra tout à l'heure sur ces questions d'éducation, et notamment l'éducation non formelle qui nous intéresse à travers les bibliothèques. On a parlé de cette rupture informationnelle, non, de cette rupture socioculturelle avec Patricia, on a parlé de cette rupture éducative, éducationnelle, le mot n'est pas très beau. Euh, J'aimerais maintenant qu'on se tourne vers, vers Lucie pour, pour parler de, de cette rupture informationnelle. Alors vous, euh, à travers le travail que vous, vous menez à, à Reporters sans frontières, vous êtes au cœur de ces questions-là. Euh, Est-ce que vous pouvez nous en dire un peu plus sur les, les dynamiques qui se dégagent aujourd'hui avec le formidable essor finalement de la téléphonie mobile, de l'accès à Internet euh, Est-ce qu'il est qu y a des changements profonds qui se, qui se passent dans ce champ de l'accès à l'information Oui, tout à fait. Reporters sans frontières, il est vrai, défendre la, la liberté de l'information. Euh, nous menons un travail de dénonciation euh, des atteintes à la liberté de l'information sous la forme de publications, de campagnes que vous connaissez certainement. En revanche, euh, tout un pan de notre action consiste aussi à apporter de l'assistance aux médias, aux acteurs de l'information, divers et variés, euh, qui en ont besoin pour qu'ils puissent continuer leur démarche d'information. Et il est vrai que ces dernières années, nous avons été de plus en plus sollicités pour intervenir dans des cas de crise, d'urgence, de rupture des communications. Euh, et c'est vrai qu'en cas de, de crise humanitaire, on pense d'abord à la sécurité, à la nourriture, à un certain nombre de choses évidemment euh, absolument urgentes. Et souvent, le maintien de l'information arrive dans un deuxième temps et c'est une erreur. Euh, une information crédible peut sauver des vies. Elle peut apporter la bonne information au bon moment, aux bonnes populations, euh, pour faire en sorte que la situation, d'abord, euh, pour faire en sorte d'abord qu'on que, qu puisse parer au plus pressant, et puis ensuite euh, pour euh, aider dans les efforts de reconstruction euh, à moyen ou, euh, ou long terme. Euh, D'autant que la rupture communicationnelle est, vous le signaliez tout à l'heure, euh, absolument propice au règne de la rumeur. On a vu un certain nombre d'exemples, euh, je pense récemment euh, en Inde, où euh, une région a été traversée par, par des conflits entre communautés, euh, où euh, le, go le gouvernement a, a mis en place une censure d'Internet, un certain nombre de sites qui évoquaient la situation. Et euh, ce qui, ce qui s'est produit, c'est que différentes rumeurs ont circulé, de, provoquant des déplacements de population, puisque des menaces euh, qui n'existaient pas étaient relayées euh, par certains, certains outils. Donc euh, effectivement, attention euh, à une information crédible. Euh, RSF a pu intervenir dans, différentes, dans différents terrains, notamment en Haïti. Nous avons pu euh, intervenir rapidement après le tremblement de terre pour mettre en place un centre de presse qui fournisse accès à Internet, etc., aux journalistes et aux médias qui voulaient continuer euh, à faire leur travail. Nous avons aussi mis en place un, 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 espèce, de, un espèce de cybercafé mobile qui s'est rendu de camp de réfugiés en camp de réfugiés pour euh, aider à faire passer, à, à, à faire transiter l'information euh, dont les populations étaient, euh, étaient démunies. Alors, euh, évidemment, il y a différents types de crises humanitaires. On a parlé des, euh, des catastrophes naturelles. Il y a des crises comme dans les printemps arabes, quand, quand l'Égypte décide de couper l'accès à Internet pendant cinq jours. Euh, et effectivement, on a pu voir à quel point les, les nouveaux médias, euh, à ce moment-là, euh, avaient pu fournir des solutions originales, innovantes, et à quel point les populations, même dans des situations euh, complexes, arrivent à euh, fournir des voies de sortie. Euh, et effectivement, pendant, euh, pendant cette coupure des communications en Égypte, certains médias utilisaient des satellites, euh, des connexions satellitaires pour faire passer des infos, mais euh, tout le monde ne peut pas se payer, euh, notamment les, les médias égyptiens ne pouvaient pas forcément se permettre d'utiliser des connexions satellitaires. Euh, donc il y a notamment un, un fournisseur d'accès associatif euh, basé en France, la, la French Data Network, FDN, qui a mis en place une espèce de structure d'Internet d'urgence en utilisant des modems 56K, donc euh, autant, dire, autant vous dire qu'on revient euh, au, à la préhistoire d'Internet, euh, mais ça a pu aider à faire passer des informations et à rétablir un semblant de, 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 de communication. Euh, on a pu voir également un, un exemple que, que je trouve euh, très intéressant. En Russie, euh, pendant les, les feux de forêt qui se sont propagés dans, dans une partie du territoire, euh, un projet a vu le jour qui s'appelle HelpMap, basé sur la plateforme open source Ushaidi, 
qui euh, a permis en fait, aux internautes de signaler l'avancée des feux de forêt et puis de, de mettre en place aussi des procédures euh, d'aide. Euh, certains des internautes pouvaient signaler effectivement la progression des feux, mais aussi offrir, s'ils n'étaient pas dans les régions les plus touchées, euh, un toit, une forme d'aide euh, aux gens qui étaient obligés de quitter euh, leur, leur domicile. Donc c'est vraiment une, une, une manière de, voilà, de, de montrer la créativité, d'arriver à, à continuer à faire passer l'information. Et, euh, et voilà, dans, dans des terrains comme la Syrie aujourd'hui, il y a de nombreuses solutions innovantes qui sont, euh, qui sont explorées, euh, même dans un pays comme la Corée du Nord, qu'on pourrait considérer comme une crise humanitaire perpétuelle. Des informations, des outils passent à la frontière avec la Chine pour faire en sorte de, euh, de combler euh, cette rupture euh, informationnelle qui, euh, je l'espère, euh, vous serez maintenant convaincu, est euh, quelque chose qu'il faut euh, adresser dès le début euh, d'une catastrophe humanitaire. Merci beaucoup, Lucie. Euh On va revenir beaucoup cet après-midi dans les ateliers sur ces, sur ces questions des, euh, justement de l'usage de ces nouvelles technologies pour, euh, pour faire changer, alors, qui ont fait changer à la fois le, le travail des ONG, hein, notamment par la collecte de ce qu'on appelle les data, ces fameuses données qui permettent de mieux cibler le travail des ONG. Et, et la question qu'on se pose souvent, nous, à Bibliothèque sans frontières, c'est comment tout ça, toutes ces informations, redescendent, euh, redescendent aux populations. Et alors, c est, c est, ça me permet de faire une transition magnifique. Ça ne va pas vous surprendre, mais à Bibliothèque sans frontières, on a un certain tropisme pour les bibliothèques. Et, euh, et quand on parle d'accès aux livres, quand on parle d'accès à l'éducation, quand on parle d'accès à l'information, eh, eh bien on retrouve en fait, euh, de notre, pour notre part, un lieu qui permet tout ça. Et ce lieu, pour nous, c'est la bibliothèque. C'est la bibliothèque d'abord comme espace sécurisé, d'abord comme espace de rencontre où les gens peuvent venir échanger, communiquer, s'informer, etc. C'est aussi euh, un lieu comme espace de médiation où justement on va pouvoir euh, avoir de l'information vérifiée, où on va pouvoir apprendre euh, aux enfants à traiter l'information, à mieux la comprendre, où on va pouvoir délivrer de l'aide euh, dans des situations d'urgence humanitaire. Ce lieu de la bibliothèque qui chapote un petit peu ces trois ruptures, euh, je crois qu'aujourd'hui il est incarné et bien incarné par, euh, euh, de, de, par Maria Garrido qui, euh, bah, à travers son travail, à travers ses recherches, a, je crois, beaucoup parcouru les, les bibliothèques à travers le monde. Et euh, elle va nous parler aujourd'hui des bibliothèques euh, du, euh, du Chili, après le, le, le tsunami, le tremblement de terre de 2010 euh, qui a euh, touché le nord du Chili. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you for the invitation uh, to you at Libraries Without Borders. And it's an honor for me to share the panel with you and be here with you. Libraries have long been recognized as important actors in their communities in many different levels. Uh, in emergency situations, however, there's seldom um, any government, as of today, that includes libraries as part of their emergency plans. Uh, in 2010, recently, the U.S. made libraries a formal actor of emergency plans, and yet they play very important roles. We wanted to contribute to this discussion together with the voice and the efforts of Libraries Without Borders, and like you were describing, the changing in actors in emergency situations uh, with this research. Uh, in 2010, sorry, I need to, um, in 2010, um, there was a very big earthquake in Chile. It's the seventh biggest recorded earthquake um, in history since earthquakes have been recorded. They triggered also a tsunami that devastated most of southern Chile. Chile is a very interesting country to understand the role of libraries and can, how can they contribute and the role they can play in emergency situations because it has an incredible library network. And there's a vision in the country about access to information and access to freedom of information that has created 430 libraries of different sizes in the entire country, in, well, not the entire country, but in different regions of the country. And in 2003, in collaboration with the Gates Foundation, all these libraries were connected to the internet. So this is a, a, an, an incredible place to understand how they, they play the role, the role they play, not only as spaces for safety and social, but also the role the librarians and staff play as bridges to information, as bridges to social dynamics, and as bridges to their community. So it's very important to understand that. So this research was uh, um, um, inspired by that recognition, hoping to understand these dynamics 
So the earthquake was in February 27, 2010. We visited 20 libraries in the country and talked to the library staff to understand how they, the, the, the different activities they engage in and how they supported their communities uh, after in the aftermath of the earthquake and the tsunami. Um, um, this is Biblio Redes, the network that I was mentioning, exists in Chile that has 400 and I believe 27 libraries as of today in the country. Um, this is a very interesting uh, picture. It says in Spanish, Mr. Uh, to the library user, we apologize for the book. The is a bit dusty. Uh, it's another survival of the earthquake. So, so books are very important. These spaces are very important social spaces, not only as brick and mortar, but also as mobile places They go to place to place. There were three very important roles that we saw libraries playing, and these roles change as the, the, the aftermath of the, in this case, the earthquake uh, uh, progressed. So the, 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 the needs they play, the needs they fulfill, uh, the first phase of the earthquake were not the same six months later. So it is important to capture that the differences in the, the roles they play based in the differences as the needs emerge from the earthquake. I apologize, I have a very bad cold, so I might be coughing in the middle of the... So three very important things. One, access to critical information in the aftermath of the disaster. Um, information to food, for shelter, to understanding and, 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 and learning about families and friends being lost. There's a lot of chaos, miscommunication, and overload of communication and information in the, in the midst of a crisis. Um, libraries, uh, the social spaces, and the librarians using their knowledge and using their, their participation and understanding of their communities were able to sort through all the information that was given by the government and otherwise uh, to be able to bring that information to the people and connect people to people that was lost or not found and find food, find shelter. That was the first role, and I'll show you some of the pictures. And as I said, there were shifting roles as well. Once the, the uh, people have been found, one, the first two weeks of the disaster, the next step for people was to find information for the government to require, to, to receive assistance to rebuild their homes. Almost half a million homes were destroyed with the earthquake. Almost a thousand people died. Um, so this is a very important contribution the librarians and the staff made to their communities, trying to sort out through government information and make it the applications for government requests for subsidies and contribution to rebuild their homes during the second and third and fourth week of the disaster. And then a third very important space that we have, as I said before, libraries are not only access to books and literature and information and communication, they, they are by definition social spaces where different dynamics as Mr. Nikov pointed out are renegotiated and recreated and it's a very important it's a very important role they play, not only as these intermediaries, but as the space they help engender, they can contribute to the emotional well-being of the communities and means the chaos and the destruction. And I'll show you some of the pictures. Um, so as I said, there are two spaces in the, two, two components in the role of libraries. First is, of course, the social component, and second is the technological component, in the sense of access to information, access to the internet, that can allow to sort to communication information for the people in their communities. These are some of the, the, the um, roles that we saw they play, from locating and interacting with family and friends, downloading government forms, helping them to fulfill the forms, and checking updates about conditions of the areas affected, working with the media actually in being able to triangulate most of the roads in, uh, to the south were hampered so many, many of the news uh, agencies could not reach there. They were able to get information on the, through the librarians that were working in their communities even though some of them have themselves been victims of the airport, either losing their homes or having friends and family losing homes. And then the social component, as I mentioned, which uh, um, were able to establish emergency operation centers working with the military, all of the military and the police and the firefighters, all of this, it did, it, they, they never received training for this. This was all um, 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 uh, self-motivated and um, improvised in many ways. Um, using the knowledge they have and the knowledge of their community. So it's important to acknowledge that, and hopefully with the efforts like your organization, that they can receive the resources they need to be able to properly be prepared and, and take even more advantage of the roles like that. And of course, even participating in some of the cleaning up of the damage. 
So these are some of the pictures that you see. And another important component that I mentioned, it has been mentioned here a lot, this, the libraries also were provided spaces for kids to be able to read, play games in the internet, so to create not only a safe space, but a, a space of entertainment amidst the chaos and destruction that was surrounding them, to have an emotional component that could help them overcome the, the this is another of the pictures that are helping them to fulfill government and insurance claims. This is another one of the libraries that opened during the earthquake to allow kids to check on Facebook and be able to play games, just to get their minds of what they had encountered outside. And the mobile library, as I said, not only about brick and mortar uh, libraries, also about the mobility of these social spaces that they can reach communities that are either remote or where the, 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 the crisis has curtailed access to it. It's another one. And uh, I try to go fast so there's chance for... <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Alors, uh, Merci beaucoup pour cette, euh, cet, 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 cet exemple qui donne euh, beaucoup de, de pistes pour réfléchir. Je crois que cet après-midi, Fred, euh, Fred Gittner nous présentera euh, l'incroyable travail réalisé par les bibliothèques du Queens après le passage de l'ouragan Katrina. On aura également un bibliothécaire qui vient du Mali, etc. Donc on, on, on va avoir beaucoup d'exemples de ce type-là, de comment les bibliothèques ont pu changer la vie euh, des gens après une catastrophe ou dans un conflit. Alors j'aimerais peut-être vous demander... On va, on va, peut-être ouvrir le, le, le micro à la salle, mais simplement vous demander très vite, chacun d'entre vous, euh, un souvenir, un exemple euh, d'une un, fois où vous avez travaillé à travers ben, vos, vos multiples euh, projets dans, 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 dans des situations humanitaires, et vous avez pu voir euh, le rôle qu'une bibliothèque a, a pu jouer, où, euh, où vous avez pu travailler avec une bibliothèque. Qui veut se lancer Ce n'est pas, pas moi, c'est mon père qui a été enfant à Guatemala quand il y a eu un grand tremblement de terre. La ville a été totalement détruite. Il a dû aller avec ses frères et sœurs, ils ont perdu tout, à vivre avec leur grand-mère qui était dans, dans le, le camp. Il n'y elle avait, elle, avait pas accès à, à rien, mais il y avait une très bonne bibliothèque scolaire. Et il a dû aller à travailler, il n'avait pas d'argent et il s'est éduqué dans cette bibliothèque, lisant les livres qui étaient là. Il a fait tous ses examens tout seul. Euh, il, a, il est allé à l'école de médecine, il est devenu médecin, il a fondé une université, il a été le chirurgien de, général de Guatemala. Euh, et c'était la bibliothèque et la lecture qui a sauvé sa vie. Et il a été, pardon, très traumatisé. Ça, je ne veux pas dire qu'il a été une personne totalement bien dans sa tête, mais il a réussi à faire une vie très, très importante à cause des livres et de la bibliothèque et de la lecture. Donc pour moi, ça a été toujours la raison pour laquelle je crois que c'est tellement important d'avoir ces, ces accès. Merci. Euh, Lucie, Lucie peut-être oui, effectivement, ça a été mentionné plus tôt, les interactions entre, euh, entre médias, euh, acteurs de l'information et, et euh, bibliothèques et, et ceux qui, euh, qui gravitent autour des bibliothèques sont, sont assez euh, courants, effectivement. Et je pense notamment euh, au soutien que nous pouvons apporter, par exemple, à des radios communautaires en, en Amérique latine, que ce soit en Bolivie, en Équateur ou, ou, euh, ou en Colombie, où effectivement, nos chemins croisent très souvent euh, des gens qui sont impliqués dans des bibliothèques, euh, parfois mobiles, et qui apportent une information importante à des populations sociales souvent isolés et qui n'ont euh, souvent que euh, ce type d'information euh, à disposition. Donc euh, c'est vraiment effectivement crucial. Chris, peut-être Le meilleur exemple que j'ai vu de l'utilisation d'une librairie, c'était en fait, vous ne pouvez pas le dire une librairie, c'était mobile. Il y avait des boxes de livres qui étaient mouvées autour des écoles. Les écoles elles-mêmes n'avaient pas de bâtiments. C'était dans la centrale de Guinée in 2001, International Rescue Committee was running schools. There were no school buildings, but there were boxes of supplementary readers. They had some basic textbooks and they had extra readers uh, for the kids. And those readers were in very simple English. It was terribly important what was a very good feature. They were not very complex books. The kids were much older than their normal age level, uh, grade level. So there were 16-year-olds in second grade. And those kids just loved having access to those books. And the, 
they were moved around. One final lesson from that experience, it was essential to keep them both accessible but also secure because when once a box of books was left out in the open, it disappeared. The books were stolen immediately. But the, the, the opposite, I saw the opposite experience in, uh, in a refugee camp in Kenya with southern Sudanese in, in Kakuma. Uh, the teachers were so afraid to use their school boxes of books. They also had portable libraries. They were so afraid to, that they might be stolen, they didn't use them. They left them locked up. So the answer is there has to, no, seriously, there has to be provision for lockable, secure cupboards that can't be the whole cupboard carried away um, and, oui. and make, make the books available but secure. Oui, c'est quelque chose qu'on retrouve euh, assez souvent, cette, euh, cette idée de, des professeurs qui sont, j'allais dire, traumatisés à l'idée de donner des livres à des enfants qui pourraient les abîmer. Euh, Alain Mabankou, euh, avec qui on avait discuté autour de ces questions, l'écrivain d'origine congolaise, expliquait que quand lui est rentré dans, à, à Brazzaville et qui a donné un, un livre comme ça à, à une personne de sa famille. Et une semaine après, quand il voulait repartir et récupérer son livre, en fait, il devait faire le tour du quartier parce que le livre avait fait, été passé de main en main et, et finalement, euh, tout le, tous les voisinages avaient pu, euh, avaient pu parcourir le livre. Donc des fois, c'est vrai que c'est un peu dur de retracer un livre euh, quand on n'y prend pas garde. Euh, Jackie, peut-être euh yes, experience the same thing in many places where there's such pride around having libraries and particularly some of the community libraries and I'm thinking quite recently of uh, when I was in Uganda in the Naku Valley settlement that you walked into at this point it was a youth center that also had a large library component and the youth were there interacting and it was a social space but they were so happy to be able to showcase the resources that were there and then they showed us the digital Uh, element that they had to this library, which was part of the Community Technology Access Center, where they were able to interact with the world. And I think it's really important to also recognize the pride that communities have around these resources and the recognition of how important these are. People time and time again tell me, you know, we recognize that the world's becoming increasingly digital. And we're proud that we can be part of that. We're not being left behind in sort of this digital divide as people talk about, that we're actually having an active role and can communicate with the outside world, but are also building the skills to be able to compete and act within it. And I think those are really important. Uh, bah, et, mais oui, c'est vrai que, Maria, ça va être compliqué tout ce que tu viens de nous raconter, une histoire, mais alors, uh, peut-être, il y a quelque chose qui est ressorti, qui est intéressant, c'est que, Finalement, que l'on soit dans des situations humanitaires ou des situations plus de, de développement, de long terme, la bibliothèque, elle revient toujours. Et, euh, et je crois que c'est quelque chose qui était euh, au, une base de, de, de vos réflexions, de dire euh, que la bibliothèque, c'est aussi ce, ce continuum, cette continuité entre l'urgence et le développement. Je crois que c'est un point qu'on va aborder demain, mais peut-être euh, peut qu'à travers ton travail, tu l'as particulièrement exploré. Ah, euh, L'idée que la bibliothèque, ça, ça peut jouer un rôle de continuité entre la situation d'urgence, d'anormalité et, 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 et la situation de plus long terme de reconstruction et de développement. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, that, that we saw many ex well, an example of everything. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Um, where their understanding of the needs in the community allow them to be able to participate in this long-term reconstruction. And, uh, and uh, it's actually a, an interesting story and also with a funny touch. Uh, one of the places where the library was destroyed, uh, two weeks later, the community organized themselves to reappropriate a bar that had all the windows and everything um, um, painted in black to paint it in white and recreate the library that had been destroyed. So I think like you said, libraries are resources where people value those resources and the ability of them to be able to continue their participation in, a, in, a, in an emergency situation is based on the resources they can have for, for their communities and also in the ability of governments to recognize their role so they are able to be part of the formal emergency response. Merci beaucoup, Maria. Euh, je vois que le temps file à toute vitesse. Est-ce que, est que la salle a une ou deux questions euh, peut-être à poser à notre, à notre panel Ah, une main se lève ici. Oui. 
I would like to thank you a lot, uh, Crystal Bo, because uh, I was uh, I agree a lot uh, with uh, what you you said. Mais du coup, euh, j'avais une question à l'ensemble des participants. Euh, C'est vrai que vous représentez des nouveaux acteurs de l'humanitaire. Vous avez insisté là, sur cet euh, aspect. Et la question que je voulais poser, c'est dans, notamment dans les situations d'urgence, comment ces nouveaux acteurs vont s'articuler avec les préexistants C'est-à-dire, euh, quel est euh, alors on connaît par exemple ce nou, nouveau concept euh, des, pour les petits-enfants de 0 à 5 ans, de euh, Early Childhood Care and Education, pour, par exemple, hein, qui est euh, très, très employé actuellement, mais qui n'existe pas pour les plus grands, pour les adultes, comment vous allez organiser votre... Est-ce que vous allez vous organiser verticalement, en quelque sorte, ou alors en cross-cutting avec les, les autres partenaires Et je pense que c'était intéressant, vos sept points, parce que, justement, vous donniez à la fois les limites et les potentialités d'articulation avec euh, la protection, les problèmes de, de ségrégation de genre et les problèmes médicaux et psychologiques. I'll give three very, very quick points in answer to your question. How do the new actors integrate their work with that of existing humanitarian actors? One is to do with coordination, the second is to do with scale, and the third is to do with networking. On coordination, in most emergencies that involve internally displaced people and natural disasters, there is a humanitarian cluster mechanism. And the kind of work you do fits perfectly with child protection, protection in general, with education, possibly with health even. They're in fact, almost every technical sector. You folk need to be working with the cluster, uh, the units that head up the global clusters to let your services be known so that in the deep field where people might need your services, the message can be passed. The second is about scale. You have to be very careful. The, the refugee camp in... in Somalis in Dadaab that Alexander mentioned, there are nearly 500,000 refugees there. Are you going to provide a service that somehow meets a, a reasonable amount of that need? Maybe you can't, but you need to make sure that your work does not just help a tiny group who become something like an elite within that, within that very dynamic and dangerous social setting. So it's the first is coordination, the second through, through clusters, or if it's refugees, UNHCR is normally the one coordinating the operation. So the second is scale, the third is networking, and at least in the area of education, I would strongly recommend that you uh, have a look at the website of INI, Interagency Network for Education in Emergencies, which is a tremendous uh, magnifier of messages about uh, your, the kinds of work you do would be deeply appreciated. So it's www.ineesite, I-N-E-E-S-I-T-E.org. And there you have 10,000 education and emergency professionals who would be very interested to know about what you're doing. Uh, just to compliment, I think those are three really important points. I think there's also been a lot of recognition, as I said earlier, from organizations like UNHCR that we don't necessarily have all of the capacities to reach the people or the technical capacities as things begin to change. There's been huge uh, shifts within education and education pedagogy and you know new approaches taking on play-based learning and the importance of early childhood education. And we recognize that we need to reach out and connect with other partners. And so INEE and the clusters are two great places from the education arena. But it's also about you know, communicating your services and what's available so that we can work together. Because there is great recognition that you know, this has to be a collaboration and we need to work together. And that also goes with reporters and other organizations where there is such an overlap here when we look at access to information and communication and the effect that it can have within emergencies. Merci beaucoup. Alors c'est intéressant puisque cette discussion qui naît là à la fin de à fin de ce panel ouvre finalement le, euh, la discussion qui aura lieu demain sur ces questions-là, sur les leviers politiques pour euh, 
une meilleure prise en compte de ces dimensions euh, intellectuelles euh, de l'être humain en danger. Euh, effectivement, c'est quelque chose qui a été au cœur de notre, notre combat, hein, parce que quand on est intervenu en Haïti, on s'est retrouvé complètement bloqué, parce qu'évidemment, il y avait des clusters, mais il n'y en avait aucun euh, qui nous parlait, finalement. Alors, il y avait un cluster éducation, il y avait un cluster, il me semble, protection de l'enfance, mais finalement, que ce soit... On se retrouve un petit peu euh, euh, dans le même... Euh, dans, le, dans, le, dans la même situation que les, que les, que les psy euh, et les programmes de santé mentale qui se retrouvent en fait dans une, euh, bah, dans une approche complètement transversale sur l'ensemble des questions et, euh, et qui ne rentrent pas franchement dans les cases. Donc euh, bah, je laisse le débat ouvert pour, pour demain, on continuera cette discussion. Euh, D'ici là, je vais clore cette table ronde parce qu'on est très en retard et qu'on va vous laisser le temps d'aller déjeuner. Les travaux reprennent à 14h. Euh, je vous remercie vraiment pour votre participation ce matin. On se retrouve donc à 14h dans les trois salles que j'ai indiquées tout à l'heure. Et pour les, les intervenants et les partenaires qui sont invités au déjeuner, on se retrouve dans la cour en bas de la Maison de l'Amérique latine. Merci beaucoup.